Um, hello, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, my name is Marina Vivarelli, and I'm a pediatric nephrologist working in Rome, Italy. And I'm going to try to give you um, an update on C3 glomerulopathy today. And um, I'd like to start with just introducing you to um, the kidney and to what a glomerular is, because I think it's going to be important for a lot of the things that we're going to talk about while we try to understand together a little bit better about what C3 glomerulopathy is and how best to manage it. So as you very well know, we all have two kidneys and the kidneys are made up of um, uh, various hundreds of thousands um, of glomeruli um, in each kidney, up to sometimes one million are present in each kidney. And um, glomeruli are these um, small structures that filter blood to make urine. And um, in urine, we um, accumulate all the toxic substances that we need to eliminate that we produce um, during our uh, common uh, life um, every day. And um, so this is what a glomerular looks like. The glomerular structure is a bundle, and it's a bundle of capillaries and podocytes. And podocytes are special cells that are epithelial cells, so they're cells that derive from the skin, even though they're within the kidney. And capillaries are tiny, tiny blood vessels. And the tiny, tiny blood vessels and the podocytes are all um, tightly connected together um, to filter blood from the capillaries into the um, epithelial space where the urine is formed. And the structure um, that um, interconnects and that closely um, uh, connects the um, capillaries with the podocytes is called the glomerular basement membrane. And it's really a sieve or a filter. And so I'm, I'm showing it to you here um, where I put the red U is from the urinary side. And you see these are the foot processes of the podocytes. And from the blood um, side where uh, you see the blue B, that's instead the special um, wall of the capillaries, which is um, made up of all the little holes that filter um, the blood. And so you see how this is a very fragile, extremely complicated structure that um, produces urine every day within our kidneys. Um, so when you have damage of the glomerular basement membrane, what happens is that this very fine structure of all these little foot processes that are um, tightly connected one to the other and connected to the um, capillary um, vessel walls becomes ruined. And um, what happens is that you have um, loss of and passage into urine of substances that are precious, that you're, you're not supposed to eliminate, like toxic substances. And so the prime example is um, proteins, different types of proteins. And so you have leaking of proteins into the urinary space. You lose a lot of proteins. And this is what happens, for example, in nephrotic syndrome. I just wanted to show you what it looks like. You see, so this is what happens and how it gets damaged to lead to proteinuria. So I then wanted to move on to a little bit more of um, what we knew and what we now know about C3G, but we're going to look at a lot of figures, and I hope that these figures are going to be easier to understand now that I've shown you what happens within a glomerulus when it gets sick. So disease classification and definitions of this entity that we're going to call C3G from now on has been changing a lot over history. So historically, there was an old classification of glomerular inflammatory disease called MPGN or membranoproliferative GN. And MPGN was divided into three types, depending on where the damage was and where these deposits that can be high or low density were. So if they were more on the endothelial side, so on the side where you see on the top um, panel, the red arrows on the C, so on the circulation side, it was called MPGN type one. If it was smack in the middle, of the glomerular basement membrane, and you see this is high density. You see that instead of being sort of charcoal gray, the deposits are almost black because they're much denser, and you see them with the red asterisk. The disease was called MPGN type 2, which is also called appropriately dense deposit disease. And if it was instead both on the subendothelial and on the subepithelial um, side of the, of the glomerular basement membrane, and you see on the lower side, surrounded by three red arrows, a hump, which is a large circular deposit, then you would have called it MPGN type 3.
And what we knew, and this is um, up to the early 2000s, was that this specific form, DDD, dense deposit disease, was um, created, was determined by um, deposits specifically of complement. This was known already many, many years back. So we knew that in this disease, the driver of disease was complement dysregulation leading to deposition of C3 mainly and of other complement proteins within the glomerular basement membrane, breaking this fragile structure and leading to leaking of protein into urine and so to protein area and in some cases nephrotic syndrome. So the first paper that pointed in a new direction was this paper that came out in 2007. And what was revolutionary about this paper, which was published by a French group, is that they showed 19 patients that had a proliferative um, glomerular nephritis that was not an MP M MPGN, in which there was evidence of complement dysregulation, the exact same types of um, dysregulations that had been historically always associated with DDD, but these patients did not have the dense intramembranous deposits. They had isolated C3 deposits, but the position of these deposits was different from what was typically associated with DDD. And this was really important because it broadened the spectrum of this disease and introduce the terminology C3 glomerulopathy as all those glomerular diseases in which there's C3 depositing within the GBN and determining this damage and leading to proteinuria. So I'm going to show you now some pictures, and you see these are pictures um, in the pink on the um, left-hand side of glomerular lesions, different glomerular lesions. They're all proliferative, but they're very different one from the other. You don't need to be a pathologist to recognize the differences. And I just wanted to sort of make you understand how we now know that in C3 glomerulopathy, um, the lesions can be very varied from patient to patient. They can be, they're always proliferative, they, but they can be more or less intensely proliferative. What um, is um, common is the deposition of C3, which it stains in green by fluorescence and uh, that you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, and you see that in all of these patients. And in some cases, the level and the intensity of uh, proliferation and inflammation that you see can be um, different if you're looking at an early um, um, moment in the disease history or if you're looking further down the line. So um, the proliferation will change as the disease becomes more um, chronic and it, as the um, lesions are less fresh. The common feature is always this intense C3 deposition as is shown here in the lower panel. Um, Another important concept for you to have is that, and that is something that we've understood more recently, and I'll show you an example from a patient that we um, have cared for here in Rome, is that sometimes you don't only have C3 by immunofluorescence in the renal biopsy. So this is an example of a 12-year-old girl who presented with um, nephrotic syndrome and low circulating C3, as is often seen in this condition. And we biopsied her, and you see that by immunofluorescence, her glomeruli really stand out. And they have a lot of C3, but they also have a lot of IgG, which stands for immunoglobulin. And um, this is often seen in children. So what we did was that we treated her with immunosuppression with um, steroids and mycophenolate, and then she maintained a little bit of protein area and a lot of very severely reduced C3, circulating C3. Um, in her blood. So we re-biopsied her. And what we saw was that now she really had only C3 deposition. And so she clearly was not an immune complex MPGN, but a C3 glomerulopathy. But you know, this can be seen in the same patient depending on when you perform the biopsy. And um, so in this disease, IgG deposition can be just as intense as C3. This is particularly true in children because the IgG deposition is often triggered by infection. And this um, is a typical um, presentation of these types of renal diseases um, to be triggered by infection, especially upper respiratory tract, so cough and um, uh, inflamed, um, an inflamed throat, which is typical of younger children. Um, so if you look at the um, kidneys at a higher magnification on the biopsy, you can distinguish within C3 glomerulopathy between 
dense deposit disease, which is the um, original lesion that we had um, know that we knew about even before, and that you can see here on the left hand side, or C3GN, where as you can see the deposits here with the white arrow are less intensely dark gray and they can be puffy and round forming so-called humps and they're um, more on the subepithelial side of the GBM. And um, the distinction by electron microscopy between these two forms um, allows us to, to subclassify the disease, but both of these forms are complement mediated. And important research um, performed at the Mayo Clinic demonstrated this very convincingly. They took um, from a renal biopsy, you see they circled around with the green, a glomerulus, and they took all of the protein that were within that glomerulus, both from a patient with DDD and from a patient with C3GN. And they looked at the composition of the proteins within the glomeruli that were deposited within the GBN. And what they saw, so within the glomerular basement membrane, and what they saw was that in both of these forms, there was a ton of complement. So this pointed to the fact that um, the driver of the disease was the same in these two forms. And so that it is correct to classify and define both DDD and C3GN as C3 glomerulopathy. So going a little bit more broadly now, um, the new classification, and this can be important when you're looking at um, your biopsy results, when you're interpreting what you may read, is that when you're speaking about C3G, DDD, C3GN, and ICMPGN, you're talking about a glomerular disease that is characterized by, by um, intense inflammation um, and that is driven by deposition of complement within the glomerular basement membrane, which leads to proteinuria. And all of these conditions have different names, but it's the same, ultimately the same mechanism that is determining them. Yeah. So C3 deposition, often predominant, but not exclusive. So diagnosis of C3G requires a renal biopsy. It requires expert care. So you need to look for a nephrologist who is an expert in glomerular disease because these are very rare conditions. And another important thing is that to pinpoint and better define the complement abnormality that is um, upstream of what is then happening in the kidneys, um, both genetic and serologic, which means measuring different complement components in the blood, a workup is, can be very useful and it should be performed in expert hands. So what causes C-theory glomerulopathy? I'm gonna to try to uh, explain that to you a little bit more. Um, so we know that different alterations in the alternative pathway of complement lead to these diseases. So the alternative pathway is one of the three pathways of complement. Complement is a group of proteins that would live within our blood and that um, are part of the immune system. So they um, have the, the, um, the objective of protecting us from infections. However, in some individuals, for different reasons, when these proteins are activated, they remain activated. They don't shut off nor as they should normally do once the infection is over. And this hyperactivation of these proteins causes them to be deposited um, where the blood is more filtered. So the main place is within the glomerular basement membrane. And the reason for which some individuals are not as good as others at turning off the complement pathway is either genetic, um, and you have different mutations in complement factors or in complement regulators, or because they have circulating antibodies that block the complement regulators, um, not allowing this part of the immune system to shut off once it has been activated by an infection or a trauma or a stress of some sort to protect us. This is a simplified view of the three um, pathways, alternative, classical, and lectin. And it's just to drive um, home the concept that the complement system is triggered most often by infection. And this is, you know, uh, an overview of what it then determines within the kidney when it isn't shut off correctly. 
So um, this is a figure showing you the same concept. So this is um, sort of a cartoon way of showing you in the lower part of the figure, the glomerular basement membrane being damaged and how uh, upstream of that damage, there's the inflammation. But we now know that in these conditions, further upstream, there's the complement pathway chugging along and not turning off and all of that complement going into the kidneys and determining the inflammation. I've, I hope um, I've made this a little bit more clear. And that's the reason why when we made a, a diagnosis of this type, it's very useful to measure different circulating factors, different antibodies, and to look for certain genetic alterations of complement to be sure that our diagnosis is correct and that this is indeed the condition that um, a certain patient has. Um, so there are also some markers that we can measure in the blood um, that are circulating like C3 and C5B9. And according to renal histology, so according to whether you have DDD or C3GN, um, recent research has shown that they can be different. This is important um, in um, view of the fact that we um, are going to have um, more availability of different new therapeutic um, agents that are able to inhibit the complement in different ways. So um, recent research has shown that in DDD, um, mostly you tend to have more of a dysregulation of the C3 convertase, so a little bit more upstream. And instead in C3GN, you tend to have more of a dysregulation of the C5 convertase, so a little bit more downstream because the cascade is one, two, three, four, five through nine. So three is upstream of five. And um, this kind of thing is the type of studies that is necessary to better understand and better fingerprint patients, um, a, a specific patient with um, C3 glomerulopathy, because the disease is very heterogeneous and different patients will have very different um, circulating um, pictures when we go to measure the different proteins in their blood. So clinical features, what are the presenting symptoms of C3 glomerulopathy? So I'm not going to talk about this in detail because it's probably the part that um, you guys are more confident and know best because it's happened to either you or one of your dear um, um, family people. Um, but clinical presentation in C3 gomerlopathy is a very heterogeneous. And I did want to drive this concept home because it is important. Um, some patients, especially children, will present with hematuria. So they will notice that their urine is red. Some people will not notice anything. They'll end up doing a urinalysis for um, whatever checkup, and they will realize that they have low-grade proteinuria, but they hadn't realized anything particular. They didn't feel um, funny or weird in any way. And some, instead, um, patients will present with nephrotic syndrome, and um, that means that you become very puffy, and it's called edematous, and you have swelling of the eyes and of um, often the legs and with weight increase, and that is due to a very extreme and very um, intense loss of proteinuria of protein in the urine. Um, there can be extra renal features. This is a figure of a very extreme form that, and very rare that is called partial lipodystrophy, which is due to complement depositing um, in different ways um, within the skin and giving inflammation. But I've actually never seen that. And I, in my experience, it's only something that is described in textbooks. Whereas Drusen, which is the accumulation of C3 on the macula of the eye, um, is more frequently seen and actually has been described in um, these diseases in a relevant percentage of, of cases. The reason why I'm showing you the, the extra renal features is simply to um, help you understand that what is going on in a patient with C3 glomerulopathy is happening in the blood and the circulation. So it can af affect different organs, even though it primarily affects the kidney. And in terms of practical um, consequences, the um, drusen um, only in certain cases and only in much older um, people who have had the disease for many, many years can give some fuzzy spots to vision, but it doesn't impair significantly vision at all. It's just something that um, we tend to look at to sort of once again be sure that we have categorized the patient correctly and that we have made a correct diagnosis. So if the patient has drusen as well, that's a further proof that that patient has been correctly diagnosed with C3 glomerulopathy. So management, how do we cure C3 glomerulopathy? What are the best options at this moment in time? 
So initially, um, as I was saying, a renal biopsy um, expert um, uh, nephrologist that knows these diseases because they are very rare. And the other thing that is tedious, but extremely effective and very low tech, uh, even though very um, uh, important and also very challenging for the patient is a low salt diet. I don't know exactly for what reason, but what we have seen as nephrologists is that C3 glomerulopathy is exquisitely sensitive to salt, to sodium. So reducing um, your intake of salt when you have a diagnosis of this sort is extremely effective by itself without taking anything else in reducing protein area. And any therapeutic agent of any sort that you will then add on will be much more effective if the diet is really truly a low sodium diet. So this is something that within our clinic, for example, we really try to implement giving a lot of advice of how to optimize this type of a diet and how to make it compatible with a good quality of life because it is something that can be done um, if it's done correctly. You know, eating a lot of really yummy, wonderful things, um, you get used to eating um, less salty and it actually is completely fine, but it, do it does take some getting used to and I think it is really worth the effort. Another concept that I wanted to really try to um, drive home is the importance of reducing proteinuria and why are we so fixated with um, you know, the urinary protein over creatinine ratio or the 24 hour proteinuria. Um, the reason for which we consider reduction of proteinuria absolutely essential for correct management is that um, a lot of studies have shown that the probability of renal survival, of kidney survival, so um, the reduction of uh, accrual of damage to your kidneys is absolutely linked to the degree of proteinuria that you have. So even reducing proteinuria without completely eliminating it saves months and years of renal function with whatever mean, you can obtain it with low salt diet, you can obtain it with a complement inhibitor or anything in the middle. If you reduce the protein area, even if you don't bring it down to zero, you are substantially increasing the survival of your kidneys and giving the patient years of kidney function, of normal kidney function. So this is the goal of all treatment. So KDGO guidelines, the new ones are in preparation, almost finalized. They will be out in the fall. The um, sort of historical ones that we can refer to um, were published um, in 2017. And what they established, it was an expert opinion. Um, and we tried to do what we have with very little evidence was that all patients should have optimal blood pressure control, receiving uh, agents such as ACE inhibitors that you've probably heard of, um, and maybe many of you um, will have been um, given, such as ranipril or enalapril, and angiotensin receptor blockers such as irbersartan or other sartans diet, as I was um, saying before, and lipid control for adults. This is not always possible in the younger children, but lipid lowering agents are also useful in, and conducive together with the other agents in reducing protein area and um, controlling the disease. If the disease is moderate, so you have low-grade protein area and moderate inflammation, um, most patients will be given uh, prednisone, so steroids, and mycophenolate mofetil. If the disease is more severe with a nephrotic range protein area and very severe inflammation with or without um, initial kidney damage, you will probably be treated with um, more intense um, immunosuppression with uh, intravenous steroids, methylprednisolone, and other forms of um, immunosuppression that are are more rapidly acting, such as anticellular, antiproliferative agents. The most frequently used one is cyclophosphamide. And um, you can then consider complement targeted therapy that I will speak about shortly. So um, one thing that I wanted to talk about is mycophenolate mofetil, um, because it is really highly effective in a lot of patients with C3 glomerulopathy. I think this is particularly true in children, which is, for me, you know, the population that I deal with. But um, this paper um, was published in 2015, um, and a subsequent paper has just been published this year by this um, same Spanish group and other papers um, uh, publishing, publishing similar data from the United States have also been produced 
and they really show um, a really marked improvement in renal survival in patients that have been treated according to the guidelines with um, steroids and mycophenolate bofitil. So, you know, most patients, if they have um, quite a severe um, initial presentation should be treated with these agents before considering anything else. So the first challenge when we're trying to manage these patients appropriately, and this is probably something that is very uh, near and dear to many of you, is to minimize toxicity because we all know how unpleasant um, uh, steroids, oral steroids, or even worse, IV steroids can be. And we all know that at the beginning, when you also have a lot of proteinuria and you tend to swell up because of that, the combination of the two things can be um, very, very difficult. So it's important to give these drugs in a sensible way, not give them for too long. But at the same time, um, often it is more effective to give higher doses for a shorter period of time rather than petering it out for, over a long period of time. And this has been shown by many studies to be more effective and also to um, give fewer side effects um, that can be unpleasant. So I then wanted to talk to you about what's new and um, to um, broach the subject of um, that, you know, we as um, uh, physicians that have been caring for these patients for years find most exciting, which is the presence of different complement inhibitors, because obviously, you know, that's what we want to be doing. If you think about what's going on within the kidney with this inflammation that is um, determining proteinuria, and, um, you know, when you use bread and butter immunosuppression with steroids and mycophenolate, you're acting very effectively on the inflammation. But um, if you know intellectually that the inflammation is being determined by something upstream, which is different, which is complement related, you really would like to be able to act at that level. And um, as we move forward, um, and you know, currently as we speak and in the very near future, we will be able to do this more and more effectively and more and more frequently. So there are many different um, agents that um, target complement and that block the dysregulation of the alternative pathway of complement, switching it off so that you then um, reduce the C3 deposition in the kidney and slowly the kidney has time to heal itself and to repair and to stop leaking urine and I mean protein into the urine. So the first agent is uh, probably the agent that many of you have already heard about because it's been around for um, uh, almost, I'd say, a, a decade now, and it's eculizumab. So um, eculizumab is an anti-C5 monoclonal antibody, and it's the miracle drug for atypical HUS, and which is a completely different type of kidney disease. Um, but um, the atypical HUS has some of the genetic features that patients with C3 glomerulopathy also share, though, though with some technical differences. But this sort of led to the hypothesis that eculizumab could be useful also in this family of, the, of diseases. And um, with our group in Rome, we treated the first um, boy um, that had DDD with eculizumab in um, 2010. We published this um, first letter reporting this in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012. And um, this was a 13-year-old who had had DDD off and on for um, five or six years. And um, he had responded initially to um, steroids and mycophenolate. And he had then gone into a long spontaneous remission. And then he had an infectious um, flare, which triggered a nephrotic range proteinuria coming back. And um, this time, he didn't respond to anything. And this was right when we were starting to understand about complement being really important in these diseases, and um, but also actually having something that could block complement. So we tried eculizumab in this patient, really, um, it really proved transformative. So his proteinuria went down, as you can see in the gray part of the, of the upper um, graph. And we also tried um, interrupting eculizumab, and we saw that the proteinuria went right back up. And then we restarted and it went right back down. And you know, when you see that kind of a response, it's really convincing that the drug is actually doing something and it's not, you know, a fluctuation in proteinuria as patients with C3G can have anyhow, but there is a cause effect relation. And the biopsy looked much better. The thickness of the glomerular capillary walls, which is, as you have, 
as you have seen before, it can really be increased by those dense deposits went down. So we really had the impression that, you know, this drug worked great. And we thought this is wonderful. We have this new agent. We can give it to all our patients with C3G as we become really good at diagnosing them. And this, this is going to be a game changer. Um, However, we know that this drug is very expensive. It's given IV um, initially every week and then every 14 days, and there is a risk, uh, an important risk of meningococcal infection. But not only this, what we also saw, unfortunately, as we moved forward and we gave it to more patients and we performed some studies, um, the, the results were actually quite disappointing. And we really saw, and I've show, I'm showing you this paper because this is the only formal study that addressed the use of eculizumab in C3G patients. But we really saw that only about one third of the patients, between one third and half, have a, a remission, some complete, but mostly partial. So. Um, there were, you know, those initial index cases that were really um, amazing. And in my subsequent experience, I've given eculizumab to other five or six patients, and I've had it work really well um, once. But in the other cases, I really have seen little to no response. And um, speaking with other colleagues, I think this is um, pretty much um, a common experience. So it is an agent that can be highly effective, but it not always is. And it really highlights, um, this fact really highlights the heterogeneity of C3G and how um, the um, dysregulation of the complement alternative pathway is different in different individuals. So you really have to study it carefully to try to understand how to best treat each individual patient. But it's not a one size fits all situation, unfortunately. So the good news though, is that we now have a list of new complement inhibitors. And this is a list that um, I've modified from a review, a beautiful review that was published in Nature Reviews Nephrology in 2019 by um, Richard Smith's group at, um, at U Iowa. And um, it's a list of different um, drugs. And um, I'm gonna go through in a little bit more detail some of them, but really um, the concept here that I want you to um, go home with is that there are a lot of new drugs coming through. Most of these drugs are orally formulated, though not all. Um, many of these drugs act more upstream compared to where eculizumab acts, which makes them probably more effective in most forms of C3 glomerulopathy. And in red, which is obviously most relevant to my practice and may, maybe to many of you, are the trials that are actually up and running um, or about to be up and running and that are also enrolling children. So another agent that I'm going to briefly talk about is avacopan. Avacopan is a C5A receptor inhibitor. So it also acts at, at the end of the um, terminal um, complement pathway like eculizumab. The difference compared to eculizumab is that it um, blocks the receptor of C5 um, and it's orally administered twice daily, which is obviously much, much um, easier um, you know, for the patient. And it has been proven, especially in another glomerular disease, um, which is ANCA-associated vasculitis, to have really powerful anti-inflammatory properties. So it, it works really well when you have a lot of inflammation in your kidney. And um, in ANCA vasculitis, it works comparably to steroids, which is you know, really impressive um, for, for a nephrologist. It also does not block the production of C5B9, so it leaves the host defense in place. So in terms of infectious risk, it may be um, safer than eculizumab, though we're not sure because um, in the trials in which it's been used, the um, vaccinations for meningococcal infection and the antibiotic prophylaxis have always been advised because obviously it's better to be safe than to be sorry. Um, and it definitely acts downstream, so it doesn't have any effect on upstream complement inhibition. Another agent that um, is um, um, has been partially already studied, actually, um, in a trial, but the results are not available yet, and to my knowledge, it has been used only in adults, is um, called denicopan or ACH4471. And um, this is also an oral agent that targets factor D. Now, factor D is one of the regulators of C3 and of the C3 convertase. So this is an orally administered 
three or, or two times a day, depending on the molecule, um, small molecule, which acts upstream at the C3 convertase level. So it has the potential to block all of the complement alternative pathway. Um, in theory, one would think that it would um, come with a higher infectious risk, but um, all of the um, upstream um, agents that are currently be being uh, investigated, actually uh, up to now, though the data is limited, but it, you know the number of patients who have received these agents is gradually starting to grow, it actually appears to be relatively safe, though it is important to um, have the vaccinations in place and to use antibiotic prophylaxis in most of these patients while they are receiving this level of complement inhibition. Um, another one that is um, uh, already partially been used and tested and for which a larger um, trial is going to be started both in adults and in children very, very shortly, within weeks, I think, is um, it's called Pegsitacoplan. And um, this is um, subcutaneously administered once a day. And it's a cyclic peptide inh inhibitor of C3. So this blocks directly the, the formation both of the C3 and of the C5 convertase. So it's a very powerful complement inhibitor that has the potential to be extremely effective in patients in which um, this form of um, uh, complement um, dysreg is dysregulated. Another agent um, is called LNPO23, and this is an agent that blocks factor B. So again, a complement regulator that works at the level of C3. This is also orally administered, and I believe that it is given twice daily. And um, uh, a trial, um, a large clinical trial enrolling, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, only adults, is also you know, very shortly um, going to be started, if not already up and running in a few isolated centers. Um, the last uh, molecule is OMS721. This has been tried also in C3G, but it blocks the lectin pathway, so it's more likely to be effective in other glomerular diseases such as IgA nephropathy, but it may potentially be useful also in patients with C3G. The evidence is tiny and not published, so I can't say more than that at this point in time. So in conclusions, I really wanted to you to um, uh, be confident that we are much better off than we were 50 years ago in terms of prognosis and of therapeutic options that I don't believe that there will be a single therapeutic agent that will work in all patients. And so it's really important to um, put in place collaborative efforts, both to better understand the mechanisms leading to C3G and to perform effectively and rapidly studies, prospective clinical trials to inform our way of treating um, this condition. The challenges and unsolved issues, how to minimize toxicity and at the same time control proteinuria, how to preserve kidney function, of course, that's you know, the end um, objective of all of this, how to tailor therapy basing um, on a deep knowledge of the genetic and the circulating and the urinary biomarkers of each patient to say, okay, in this specific patient, this is where the problem is. And so I'm gonna to try to fix it at that level so that I'm sure that I'm gonna be effective and ultimately optimizing quality of life. But I do think that the future of patients with C3 glomerulopathy is at the moment quite bright because we really do have a lot of new therapeutic agents that we will be able to implement um, in the coming years more and more effectively. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be glad to take questions.